Polaris by H.P. Lovecraft Into the north window of my chamber glows the pole star with uncanny light. All through the long hellish hours of blackness it shines there, and in the autumn of the year, when the winds from the north curse and whine, and the red-leaved trees of the swamp mutter things to one another in the small hours of the morning under the horned waning moon, I sit by the easement and watch that star. Down from the heights reels the glittering Cassiopeia, as the hours wear on, while Charles's wain lumbers up from behind the vapor-soaked swamp trees that sway in the night wind. Just before dawn, Arcturus winks ruddily from above the cemetery on the low hillock, and Coma Berenices shimmers weirdly afar off in the mysterious east. But still the pole star leers down from the same place in the black vault, winking hideously like an insane watching eye which strives to convey some strange message, yet recalls nothing save that it once had a message to convey. Sometimes, when it is cloudy, I can sleep. Well do I remember the night of the great aurora when over the swamp played the shocking coruscations of the daemon light. After the beams came clouds, and then I slept. And it was under a horned, waning moon that I saw the city for the first time. Still and somnolent did it lie, on a strange plateau in a hollow betwixt strange peaks. Of ghastly marble were its walls and its towers, its columns, domes, and pavements. In the marble streets were marble pillars, the upper parts of which were carven into the images of grave bearded men. The air was warm and stirred not, and overhead, scarce ten degrees from the zenith, glowed that watching pole star. Long did I gaze on the city, but the day came not. When the red Aldebaran, which blinked low in the sky but never set, had crawled a quarter of the way around the horizon, I saw light and motion in the houses and the streets. Forms strangely robed, but at once noble and familiar, walked abroad, and under the horned waning moon men talked wisdom in a tongue which I understood, though it was unlike any language I had ever known. And when the red Aldebaran had crawled more than halfway around the horizon, there were again darkness and silence. When I awaked, I was not as I had been. Upon my memory was graven the vision of the city, and within my soul had arisen another and vaguer recollection, of whose nature I was not then certain. Thereafter, on the cloudy nights when I could sleep, I saw the city often, sometimes under that horned waning moon, and sometimes under the hot yellow rays of a sun which did not set, but which wheeled low around the horizon. And on the clear nights, the pole star leered as never before. Gradually, I came to wonder what might be my place in that city on the strange plateau betwixt strange peaks. At first content to view the scene as an all-observant uncorporeal presence, I now desired to define my relation to it, and to speak my mind amongst the grave men who conversed each day in the public squares. I said to myself, This is no dream, for by what means can I prove the greater reality of that other life in the house of stone and brick south of the sinister swamp and the cemetery on the low hillock where the pole star peers into my north window each night? One night, as I listened to the discourse in the large square containing many statues, I felt a change, and perceived that I had at last a bodily form. Nor was I a stranger in the streets of Olathoe, which lies on the plateau of Sarkis, betwixt the peaks Noton and Cariphonek. It was my friend Alos who spoke, and his speech was one that pleased my soul, for it was the speech of a true man and patriot. That night had the news come of Dicos's fall, and of the advance of the Inutos, squat, hellish, yellow fiends who five years ago appeared out of the unknown west to ravage the confines of our kingdom, and finally to besiege our towns. Having taken the fortified places at the foot of the mountains, their way now lay open to the plateau, unless every citizen could resist with the strength of ten men. For the squat creatures were mighty in the arts of war, and knew not the scruples of honor, which held back our tall, gray-eyed men of Lomar from ruthless conquest. Alos, my friend, was commander of all the forces of the plateau, and in him lay the last hope of our country, 
On this occasion he spoke of the perils to be faced, and exhorted the men of Olathaway, bravest of the Lomarians, to sustain the traditions of their ancestors, who when forced to move southward from Zobna before the advance of the great ice sheet, even as our descendants must some day flee from the land of Lomar, valiantly and victoriously swept aside the hairy, long-armed cannibal Gnupkes that stood in their way. To me Allos denied a warrior's part, for I was feeble and given to strange faintings when subjected to stress and hardships. But my eyes were the keenest in the city, despite the long hours I gave each day to the study of the Nakotic manuscripts and the wisdom of the Zobnarian fathers. So my friend, desiring not to doom me to inaction, rewarded me with that duty which was second to nothing in importance. To the watchtower of Thapnen he sent me, there to serve as the eyes of our army. Should the Inutos attempt to gain the citadel by the narrow pass behind the peak Notan, and thereby surprise the garrison, I was to give the signal of fire which would warn the waiting soldiers and save the town from immediate disaster. Alone I mounted the tower, for every man of stout body was needed in the passes below. My brain was sore dazed with excitement and fatigue, for I had not slept in many days, yet my purpose was firm for I loved my native land of Lomar, and the marble city of Olathaway that lies betwixt the peaks of Notan and Cadiphonek. But as I stood in the tower's topmost chamber, I beheld the horned waning moon, red and sinister, quivering through the vapors that hovered over the distant valley of Banoff, and through an opening in the roof glittered the pale pole star, fluttering as if alive, and leering like a fiend and tempter. Methought its spirit whispered evil counsel, soothing me to traitorous somnolence with a damnable, rhythmical promise which it repeated over and over. Slumber, watcher, till the spheres six and twenty thousand years have revolved, and I return to the spot where now I burn. Other stars anon shall rise to the axis of the skies, stars that soothe and stars that bless with a sweet forgetfulness. Only when my round is o'er shall the past disturb thy door. Vainly did I struggle with my drowsiness, seeking to connect these strange words with some lore of the skies which I had learned from the Nakotic manuscripts. My head, heavy and reeling, drooped to my breast, and when next I looked up, it was in a dream, with a pole star grinning at me through a window from over the horrible swaying trees of a dream swamp. And I am still dreaming. In my shame and despair, I sometimes scream frantically, begging the dream creatures around me to waken me ere the Anutos steal up the pass behind the peak Notan and take the citadel by surprise. But these creatures are demons, for they laugh at me and tell me I am not dreaming. They mock me whilst I sleep, and whilst the squat yellow foe may be creeping silently upon us. I have failed in my duty, and betrayed the marble city of Alathaway. I have proven false to Allos, my friend and commander. But still these shadows of my dream deride me. They say there is no land of Lomar, save in my nocturnal imaginings, that in those realms where the pole star shines high, and red Aldebaran crawls low around the horizon, there has been naught save ice and snow for thousands of years, and never a man save squat yellow creatures, blighted by the cold whom they call Eskimau. And as I writhe in my guilty agony, frantic to save the city whose peril every moment grows, and vainly striving to shake off this unnatural dream of a house of stone and brick south of a sinister swamp and on a cemetery on a low hillock, the pole star, even and monstrous, leers down from the black vault, winking hideously like an insane watching eye which strives to convey some strange message. It recalls nothing save that it once had a message to convey. This is the end of Polaris by H. P. Lovecraft.